Mexico too. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, everybody, this is Donna Crew. I'm from uh, RMC Healthcare System. I want to introduce Ms. Rita Bowen. Uh, she is uh, MA, RHIA, CHPS, CHPC, SSGB, which basically means she is an expert in all of this <laughs> no, stuff. No, it means I'm 15 miles from home, but today I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she is a, in her role. She's a vice president of uh, privacy compliance and HIM policy uh, with MRO. She ensures new and existing client HIM policies and procedures are up to code. She serves as the company's privacy compliance officer, ensuring timely reporting of any kind of disclosure incident. She's also responsible for reviewing legislation to ensure that the industry response and compliance within MRO and a lot of times with uh, HEMA. She has more than 40 years experience as health information management and has a variety of HIM director and consultant roles. Uh, she sits on the Sequoia Project Board of Directors. She's an active member of Interoperability Work Group. She's a member of the HEMA, and she has served as the HEMA president and board chair and has been a member of our directors for six years and on the Council of Certification. Uh, Ms. Rada, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn it over to you. And what I said, truly, it, this is an honor to you speak to the Calhoun Medical Society. Well, it's my pleasure, Donna, and thank you all for inviting me today. Um, as you can see from my intro, I like to volunteer and I like to be I like to be uh, talking to people. So this is a uh, something I really enjoy doing, and I've really been focusing to information blocking and the interoperability rule because that's going to be a, a big effect as we move through this journey over the next three years, um, and we'll go through that process. So today, I want to talk about some of the rule highlights and then the impact that it will have to your practice. And, and we'll go through some of the major issues with that intake process regarding the um, how you receive the request, how it's evaluated, uh, review the exceptions and documentation. And then we're gonna allow time for uh, some um, Q&A. If you have questions, I'll do my best to answer those for you. So we're gonna talk about the highlights. So the intent of interoperability is basically it's data sharing. And, and it's all about the next level of care or care continuum. So it's it's allowing that, that core data element. So if you have an electronic health record that is already certified, it's already met uh, certification requirements, it's probably already allowing you to have some of those core data elements that could sheet out of that system and send directly from the system to the next level of care. Or it may be already available that's pushed to your portal. So if you have a patient portal, um, certain levels of information should be automatically traveling to that portal um, so that the patient can actually then retrieve. The intent eventually as we move through this journey is that the payers would also receive information at the time of uh, claim. Uh, so that when a coder is assigning that code, you know, they would they would tag that document and it would automatically flow with that. But that's two to three years down the road or even longer as they move this um, process. So this is supported um, in, in how we've been trying to do this and how the government's trying to do it. It's supported by the patient identification and matching. You probably remember all the way back into the Clinton era, um, uh, Hillary actually did try to do like a patient identifier uh, issue. And this has been a, a constant moving target over uh, the, the years since. Um, but, but we have secured approval now that patient identification and matching can actually be discussed at the federal level and, and start moving this because that's the key to the kingdom. That's what makes this um, workable so that you know when you're sharing Rita Bowen's information that it's Rita Bowen's record that it's going to, those identifier matching issues. The whole purpose for the data sharing, not only between the, for the patient's benefit, for the continuity of care, also ties into the data anal uh, analysis and modeling for population health. So um, 
moving that information into the HIEs, HINs, and possibly synthesizing that information where it's de-identified um, so that you can look for population health improvements is the other goal that's involved in this process. Now, the journey that we've been on started back in 2003 with the omnibus rule when it, they updated HIPAA in 2003. <laughs> that's the last update it's had. Um, until now, they've got a notice of proposed rulemaking out now, but that's a that's another story for another day. But what what HIPAA came about and where they elevated that was all about the protection, the protection of that health information. So it, it put um, put things around certain sensitive information that required um, more validation and uh, authorization of the patient to acknowledge that they knew that that sensitive information was being shared. Then we moved to 2011, where we started seeing the meaningful use, where you had to certify through meaningful use that you had an um, electronic health record that could, could automatically um, do the core data elements, uh, the CCDAs that would actually flow to the next level of care. That never really happened. You know, we saw that, but I can tell you in, in my role, um, in the release of information world, I would have people say, can you just print that document out for me? And it wasn't a document. The data elements were scattered throughout the chart. So you couldn't just print that, but it was supposed to be where they would pull automatically and then send to the next level of care, which makes it to the point now we're at 2020, the Cures Act is a making that information available. So they've actually leveled out the technology and they, they refer to that as the FAR technology or the FAR platform, platform or the HL7 platforms, which basically goes back downstream to allow an EPIC to talk to a Cerner system or a Meditech to talk to an EPIC. So that whatever systems you have, it levels out the identifiers of those elements coming out of that system so it can flow to the next one. And it's not about just getting something. It's about inserting that information into the next level of care so it's usable data. Now, the, the uh, ONC interim final rule with comment period, you know, came out two years ago. Uh, they did in indicate that they would uh, go into compliance in November of last year. It was about November 2nd was supposed to be the actual compliance date. They moved it forward and changed it to the applicability date of April the 5th because they knew that there were people that had had issues with COVID. Uh, a lot of people didn't have feet on the ground in the facilities. People were working remotely. So they didn't want to take away from that. So they wanted to allow a cent, uh, ample time and they didn't want to change the rule. They didn't want to put it back out for um, a comment period. So they just changed that date to the applicability date. The applicability date means this is when you should be making it the, uh, the bare bone minimum information available to the patient so that the patient can obtain that information from their patient portal. Uh, it does not have any compliance issues right now. The compliance dates have still, are still not enforceable at this point. Uh, um, they're actually, um, feedback as to how that will be enforced is, is not even been provided. The ONC um, again uh, decided that they would uh, provide actors more time, as I said, and they wanted to also allow time for um, FAQs to be published. And they are starting to publish those FAQs now on their website. So as you are looking to um, determine if, if this is applicable or not applicable, if this would be information blocking or not, you can go find some examples now and they will tell you this likely will be information blocking or this will unlikely be information blocking. Nothing is definitive. It is only the fact that it's likely or unlikely at this point. Now, right now, the USCD elements from um, the version one, which is the United States core data elements, that's what should be flowing unless you already have a certified EHR that had been certified previously for the core data elements. They're essentially the same, a little bit different. 
um, but not not substantially different. Um, and those will be the, the only thing that has to be flowing to the portal uh, up until October 5th of 2022. After that, on October the 6th, 2022, which may sound like it's a long ways away, but it's not, uh, you have to then have defined all of your electronic personal health information. And that's essentially your electronic designated record set. And that designated record set is, is anything that's used um, but to make a decision for the health care of that patient or um, decision about the uh, payment of that claim. So it, it's a little bit broader than just your typical health record. And then the provider incentives, um, disincentives, I should say, because there's really two rules. There's two groups. There's um, the OIG can enforce a rule with civil money penalties to a health care facility or to a um, IT vendor, but the provider disincentives will come from uh, the Centers for Medicaid and uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Now, if you are a provider that is employed by a healthcare facility, then those disincentives won't come to you that you, know, you wouldn't be fined. It would be the fine that might possibly be imposed would go to the healthcare enterprise. One thing that's a little different about this particular rule than what we've seen with other uh, penalties that can be enforced on a healthcare facility, um, if you're familiar with the Stark violation, you know, Stark is pretty black and white. It's either you, you're guilty or you're not guilty. Um, the way they have described the OIG enforcement to this rule is that they will review all of the contemporaneous notes and they will look for the intent. So in other words, when they're looking at, for that intentionality, they're, they're gonna look to see what was the intent here? Were they trying to meet this rule? And as long as you've got documentation of your attempts to comply, the severity of any civil money penalty would be much, much less. Now, this is the roadmap that uh, ONC has um, on their website. I wanted to share this with you so you could see that it started um, again in 2020s when we were looking at it because it was supposed to be November, but they changed the applicability date to this, this Monday, uh, this past Monday. So that started with specific compliance requirements um, going through to your patient portal. And basically what that means, if, if you're certified to provide those elements to the portal, then whatever timeline your facility or your organization has agreed to that it will go to the portal, it must be going to the portal. And there shouldn't be any um, exceptions to that. So in other words, if Dr. Um, Crew and then Dr. Bowen, and so Dr. Crew is very good at, at their documentation, Dr. Bowen is not, you might say, well, I have an exception that Dr. Bowen doesn't document um, timely. So those will it'll, it'll all go timely except this one. You can't have that kind of an exception. It's an all or nothing based off of your rules and regs that you're applying. And uh, if a patient were to go to the portal and they are trying to pull that information or they want to see that information and it's not available, there should be something on the portal that directs them back to a key person in your organization for interoperability that would help facilitate meeting their need. Because just because it's not on the portal doesn't mean that the patient may not be able to receive it. You may be able to push it to the portal on their behalf, or you would have a conversation with the patient regarding form and format and the content and manner that they could they would be acceptable in receiving that information. It may mean paper, it might mean a CD, but that's that's the conversations that have to take place if the patient is going to the portal directly. The intent behind interoperability uh, in this rule was that this information was flowing and it was available to the patient without special effort. In other words, no person had to be involved. It's not like traditional release of information. Traditional release of information, you get an author, you get a request, you read the authorization, make sure it's compliant, then you process the the information to go out. This is the patient. The patient doesn't have to 
do anything other than say, I want it. And they can go in the, and request that. So that should be pinging somebody in your organization if they're asking for information that's not readily available on the portal now. Then the rest of this map just shows you uh, the journey all the way out to 2023 when this uh, is to be fully implemented with EPHI, which is all of your electronic health information. So then it goes beyond just uh, that designated record set component of um, the core elements. Now, information of blocking applies to healthcare providers, uh, to certified um, developers for IT, so your, your CERNers, your EPICs of the world, um, and um, if you have an, an HIE or an HIN that you, um, your state participates in, then they, they would also be included uh, as responsible um, as to what the rule applies to. Under this rule, HIN, our networks and exchanges are defined as one and the same. They're not really different under this rule. Business associate, uh, we're not a direct actor. So like your release information vendor is not a direct actor. We're supporting a supporting cast to you. Um, so your vendor may, you may be asking your vendor to say, hey, if you get certain requests and it says certain words, make sure it goes to us so we'll know whether we need to apply um, one of the exception rules but the exceptions that are defined are regarding exceptions to what would be available on that patient portal or other means. We've already talked about the electronic health information about the EHI. Um, that's really defined no different than your um, designated record set is today. And that's HIPAA defines in the patient directive or patient request is to be uh, validated and approved to push from that designated record set, which, as I said, is much broader than the narrow health information, because um, it may include um, business office records, it could include other records, it could include um, anything that did not create a narrative for the health records. So maybe like a fetal monitor strip, there's no narrative to that that's going to be part of your designated record set. And the exclusions to that remain the same as it currently does under HIPAA. You wouldn't put psycho, true psychotherapy notes um, in um, this group of information that would be available to the patient. And, and if there was any information that was being compiled in anticipation for a civil suit or some other action, that would not need to be um, in that information. This is a schematic of uh, the United States core data elements for interoperability. That's what USCDI stands for. And you can see the subsets of information that um, is to be included to flow to uh, that patient portal so that they can retrieve that. Now, before we got started, Donna said that there was a lot of questions uh, being asked about open notes. There is nothing in the rule that requires open notes. The rule states that whatever your facility, whatever your goal is, is that you're gonna have information flowing to the portal. So if you're gonna say it's gonna flow within 48 hours after discharge, then it needs to go 48 hours after discharge. Many people are doing open notes that as soon as a consultation note is written, as soon as an HMP is provided, that it's, that it's flowing, but some are not. So that is not a requirement it's just a lot of people are moving toward that and you're hearing a lot of discussion about open notes. Um, there is a little bit of concern there that uh, there may be deficiencies in documentation. If um, people were pushed into open notes and, and having them move too quickly, um, that there could be uh, items that might be um, omitted that should have been included in a note. So open notes usually have a time frame. Um, they're not, they're, it's not a, right and then just flow. It's usually got a, a guardrail around it to of some time period. The other thing that you want to look at is from your electronic health system for these elements, whether it be the CCDAs, if it was pre-certified or the USCDI uh, version one, which is what you're seeing here, is you want to map where, where's the source of truth. So if it's um, demographics, you pretty much know what the source of truth is. There's, they're going to be there. But if it's, um, say it's the vital signs, the source of truth, is that going to be the, the vital signs on admission? 
or is it gonna be the vital signs on um, discharge? And that, that will depend on where it's flowing to. So most likely if it's for continuity of care, you want it on discharge because that's what is gonna impact that. If you are sending it to a payer to justify medical necessity, it's gonna be the blood pressure, uh, heart rates um, that were actually available on admission. So you need to know where it's flowing to and what purpose it's going to be um, used for. Now let's talk about some impacts to your practice. The way I look at this at this point, and, and again, we don't know what we don't know yet. It just started with the applicability date this Monday. Uh, I don't know if you've already had patients pinging morning information or if you've had any conversations about this at all, but the way I have had conversations is that we, we need to all collectively be working together on the intake process. So in other words, if Donna and her department receives a request from a patient that says, I want to download or I want to access access my entire medical record um, and I want this for an API, that should be a red flag immediately that, that they're really referring to interoperability. And there should be a point person in your organization that handles all of those interoperability type requests if they can't automatically get them from the portal. There should be something that pings someone in the portal that if the, or, or, or at least an identification of someone that the patient could identify and forward up, follow uh, up with, with a request. If they went to the portal and couldn't find what they were looking for, who do they contact about that? So that that point person then can look at the interoperability components. Is it possible to push the information that they're requesting to the portal? Or does it require the um, uh, content and manner exception to be uh, reviewed? The timing requirements, there has been nothing changed regarding providing a full health record under the release of information process to a patient. It's still set at 30, 30 days is the upper limit. That's not what you want to aspire to, but it should never go beyond the 30 days. The timing requirement that you're hearing about and seeing about in the interoperability rule is 10 days, but it applies to the fact that you have 10 days to respond to a patient if you have to impose the infeasibility um, exception. So that's where the 10 days comes in. The response time of providing a flow of information to that patient uh, still is set at 30. And again, I mentioned um, earlier that the FAQs are available and they're there so that you can get an idea if this, then that uh, sort of thing. So I encourage you to read those as you go th through. Now, some of the key information blocking rule keyword training that we're using, and, and uh, I'm imagining that Donna and her uh, um, counterparts in the state will also be using, is that the patient says, I request you to upload my entire record to the patient portal. Well, can you do it? Um, typically ROI, if, if you're working with an ROI, ROI vendor, we would not have the authority to push something from your EHR to that portal. Uh, so someone's gonna have to be identified that can do that. Uh, or if they say, I wanna upload my information to Google Health or to an application program, an API, a smartphone, can you even do that yet? It's not actually required yet. That's where you're gonna to aspire to go. But if they ask that question, you know that they've heard about this rule and they're trying to push to get to that. Um, there may be situations when we're processing our um, for on behalf of, a, of an HIM request that the patient may ask for um, all of their information in a certain way. And that content and manner exception may have to be applied to that because there's nothing that says that that patient has to retrieve it from the portal. That's the intent, but it's not actually required. Um, now the eight exceptions are listed here and I and I could we could do a whole session on just the eight exceptions. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into each one of these in detail. The first five basically apply to you as a provider or to the healthcare organization. Um, many of them are the same as the privacy and security, the same as HIPAA, it's the same things. The preventing harm will be something that you as a provider would have to earmark when you're doing your documentation.
um, and then that could prevent it from flowing into to the portal until you've had the opportunity to have that conversation with the patient if you know if it's something and there are certain diagnoses that you may want to not automatically flow like Huntington's disease. You may not, you may want to make sure that never just automatically flows and you, until you have an opportunity to talk with that patient. The um, infeasibility means basically you just, it's infeasible. You cannot do it. The information that they're requesting to go to the portal is not in an electronic format or it's in an old database that cannot flow. Um, or maybe it's part of a, rec a part of a documentation and you can't segment that information. It's either all or nothing. So you have to look at how the information is um, collected. The health IT performance might mean that you or have a downtime and it was unforeseeable. Um, I was in Nashville yesterday and doing a, this very same presentation for our group. And I said, for example, um, in Nashville on um, you know Christmas they had a bombing downtown and that sh that shut down AT&T and so a lot of a lot of healthcare organizations were impacted because of not being able to use their uh, technology um, and for information flow the way they typically would so that would be the infeasibility from that standpoint or it could tie to health IT performance if it's tied to a, a, an upgrade a downtime for an upgrade those kind of things the bottom three refer to your IT vendor. They, the uh, content and manner um, exception, that means they just say, I can't do it because I don't want to. They can't do that. Uh, they can't have ex exceptions for fees or licenses for um, uh, the technology. The technology has to be moved up and upgraded and certified appropriately. And they can't keep passing on that cost to you for each time. It's gonna be more of a collective um, component. And this does, I did provide the link here uh, for the uh, blocking exceptions and you can see how they are applied because one thing that is required with the exceptions uh, under each subtitle, it's it might be permitted if applicable under certain criteria and each one of those exception criteria, there might be seven criteria under um, the infeasibility. And if you're gonna call out and say that it's infeasible, you have to meet every one of those exceptions. Um, completely. So it's if this, then this, and then then you get to your outcome. It's not just a check off the box type thing. As I said, all of the requirements would have to be met. Um, some of the other exceptions are more narrow, like privacy and security uh, issues or like preventing harm. That would be uh, you as the clinician making that judgment. Um, but the content and manner is probably going to be used more than anything. That someone's going to ask for something in a way and they're asking for content and we just you, we may or may not be able to provide it as they have requested. And uh, it allows some flexibility to um, assure that the information can be received, but it requires documentation that that conversation took place and that the patient agreed to uh, receiving it in the content and manner that was agreed to. I've talked about documentation and, and that is really critical. Documentation is key to this. Uh, I would encourage if you're part of a larger organization that surely they have appointed a project manager, you want somebody that is good at taking notes and that maintains the notes. Um, the contemporaneous notes is gonna be vital as it's creating, as you're having your discussions and you're moving through the, uh, the journey and you can show the progressive of the, uh, progression of the conversations, uh, those notes will be very, very important. And I've got here MRO's role, but it would be whatever role your vendor is playing, such as, um, I know Donna mentioned she used uh, a friend of mine, Kristen, uh, in her, her services to provide release of information. So whoever's helping you with release of information does need to formulate some kind of a tip sheet. Uh, and then as they are making referrals back to the interoperability person, that's gonna be the contact person for your facility, they should document the referral date, time, and, and who they made that uh, referral to. That's gonna be important. So, uh, cause the clock is, the clock might be running at 10 days if you're gonna use the infeasibility. Now, attorneys are gonna be asserting that this rule applies to them. 
and uh, it, it does not. It's an assertion. It's a bold assertion that some attorneys will be making their, their cherry picking language out of the interoperability rule. Uh, part of my role and I'm when I'm talking, you know, we I get a lot of the uh, complaints um, and I'll be talking to to a requester who happens to be an attorney. He goes, well, it says it right here. And I said, and then what's it say next? And they go, well, well, no, it says this. I said, and read the next word. <laughs> the next word is and. An attorney can serve as a patient representative uh, acting on the patient's behalf and if they are helping to make healthcare decisions. So in other words, in the way I look at that is if they're standing in the shoes of the patient. So that's the, the key component there. Um, if you have attorneys that start asserting their authority that this applies to them in the initial phase, it's gonna apply only to the patient or to someone standing in the shoes of the patient. The biggest component with this rule is the sure that you have no practice that interferes with the patient access. So if you still require a patient, um, you know, whether they're going to the, they may go to the portal and that's good. And that's what you want to encourage them to do, to get that information themselves. But if you, a patient says, I want my health information. And you say, well, you have to come in and sign this form in front of me. Um, that might be perceived as a barrier. You want to look at anything that serves as a barrier to the patient uh, in their ability to get uh, accessibility to their health information. And um, if you see things that are barriers or if a patient tells you that they incurred a barrier that, or at least what they perceive to be a barrier, you need to share that with that interoperability contact person for your facility immediately so that evaluations can occur um, uh, process improvement can apply, and if um, policies and procedures um, and education need to reoccur, it can happen. But you do not want to have any practice that appears to be a barrier to the patient. Now, cost and fees, um, HIPAA and versus information blocking. People get a lot of confusion on this because it says information blocking, you can't charge the patient and you can't charge the patient for going to the portal and pulling it themselves. But if it's true release of information and it requires manual effort uh, to collate and pull this information and you're still providing the paper, then you can still have a cost-based uh, fee uh, applied to that. So uh, you have to look at how the information um, is being obtained. If the patient's pulling it themselves, no fee. They're going to the portal, no fee. If it still requires manual effort and there's related cost, then a, a provider or third party uh, can recover that cost that's involved. Now, this is the enforcement update. Uh, I, I won't go into this slide in detail, but you can see that the applicability date is out there, uh, moving to the full um, EPI, um, the electronic patient information by uh, October the 6th, 2022. And that's also when you have to be able to um, uh, have the ability for a patient to say, I want to upload this information to this API um, to help me control this chronic condition or whatever. Um, that is that is a requirement that's coming directly out of the Office of the National Coordinators. They're going to be driving that. And I've uh, listed that website there for you. And then I mentioned earlier that the centers and Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medicaid CMS will drive the requirement dates for the actual provider. And those will not be coming to the provider in terms of, a, um, of the individual provider, the individual clinician in the term of a civil money penalty, but it would be disincentives in some way. So um, you have to look at how um, that information um, might impact um, the information that's coming from them or how it could impact you financially there. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, about the 10 calendar days and many are asking, do all patient requests have to be just responded to within 10 days? Is that the way I should look at this? No. Um, what it means is if, if you as an actor, as a provider, a healthcare facility or a clinician, are unable to fulfill that request due to some infeasibility component, you have to provide a response to the patient within 10 business days. 
And that means it's for some uncontrollable event. You cannot send that information or you can't segment it out. Or there was unfeasible under certain circumstances because something presented, like I said, the, you know, the Christmas bombing in Nashville, that was an uncontrollable event. Um, so you have to look at how those, that is being collected. And you want to have a central person that's maintaining the communication log and the documentation of that conversation with the patient and or um, how you're going to maintain that in case you are um, contacted by the Office of the Inspector General because the OIG would be the ones that if there is a complaint uh, and if they feel it's a valid, valid complaint, they are the ones that would evaluate it. And so you want to be able to balance that and say, right here's when I talked to this patient and why I told them it was infeasible and I provided them, they made the request on this day and this is when I gave that conversation to them. We had a had conversation about would this be um, the content manner that we've discussed here, would this be acceptable? And they said yes. Uh, that's going to be important. So having a key person that maintains the documentation for your practice or your facility is absolutely essential. And that's a quick overview. Um, and I certainly want to open it up now to allow you to ask me specific questions because I know I went through that very quickly. Um, but I wanted to assure you that um, it is a journey. It's not, it's not something that everybody's ready for right now. It's amazing to me that there's still a lot of people that even though it should have been in November, where April 5th has happened this week, and I'm still talking to people who say, I don't know what you're talking about. So let's, uh, let's go through some Q&A. Donna, I'll turn it back to you and let you be the facilitator. Okay. Well, I'd like to start off with uh, just clarifying a couple of things to make sure that I as a HIS person are doing this correctly. So we've pushed a lot of education out to our, our uh, physicians about uh, releasing information timely because of all the OCR fines uh, where they've seen that um, facilities or doctor's offices in different situations are not releasing information timely. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, patient access uh, rights have been front and center. Uh, you know, when they came out in 2019 and said, uh, you know, we're going to make this a, a, a key priority and it, it kind of lay dormant for a while, but then at the late latter part of last year, they really started churning. And even this year, there's been quite a few. Um, the right of access complaints, I review every one of those for my facility to make sure that we don't have any policies or anything that would have caught us in this same trap. As I look at the 18 cases, there's only been 18 uh, cases that have actually occurred. Um, about half of those deal with behavioral health. So it makes me think that, you know, if you have behavioral health that you have in your practice, you may want to look at your practice of how you're applying rules regarding patient access to that. If it's not going to impose harm to that patient, it's not a psychotherapy node or some other component that you wanted to retrieve, the patient has a right. They know they had behavioral health records. So there's no reason to restrict that from flowing to the patient. So it, it appears to me that there are some people out there that are trying to apply the standard protections under an authorization to the patient. And you wouldn't do that to the patient. The other thing that um, I've seen in those patient access, um, those 18 cases and the other half of those that didn't deal with behavioral health, uh, uh, several dealt with the fact that the patient was asking for their information and the information they wanted wasn't from the health record. They wanted their designated record set. They wanted business office records um, and they weren't supplied. And so that tells me that whoever was providing that response didn't know that if it's a patient request, it's gotta not just come from the record, the health record, it's gotta come from the designated record set. Uh, one particular case that was in Florida went on for about nine months and what, what the patient really wanted was the fetal monitor strips. Fatal monitor strips are not typically made part of a health record, but they are part of a designated record set. The other um, cases that stood out to me is that 
the patient representative was not adequately uh, identified or rep, um, responded to. So in other words, there was one case where it was an adult child, but the adult child was mentally incompetent. Uh, and so the mother had medical power of attorney for that uh, adult child. And the, the organization that was receiving that said, no, He's, he's over 18, he has to sign it. They weren't recognizing the medical power of attorney um, appropriately. Uh, another one was a medical power of attorney for their parent and it wasn't being recognized. So I think that's, that's where it comes into play that those access requests you need to be evaluating and then walk them backwards into your or own organization to make sure you don't have any policies and procedures that could throw up a, a barrier to that patient and getting their chart or, or their information uh, and use them as education going forward. Is that helpful, Donna? Oh, yes, ma'am. All right. One of the other questions since we're a health system, we have two hospitals and we have moved our delinquent medical record rate down from 30 to seven. Whoa. Uh, in anticipation <laughs> of this to uh, be able to have the records finished, complete, and ready for any kind of request uh, to be able uh, to, if they come in here, and, and then we have, uh, we kind of have a mixed community here. We have some that are very, very tech savvy. Uh, and then, you know, we've got the, uh, some rural people that will come up and ask for their paper records uh, that they don't want to get on the internet or anything like that. Uh, so I just wanted to see if you're seeing that across uh, anywhere else uh, where people are decreasing those rates. I, I am seeing it decreased. Up, up. I, I, I commend you for moving it to seven days. Um, that's that's wonderful because, I mean, if you're truly electronic, there's really no need not to have it set right. at seven days. Um, most most of what I'm seeing is at 15 I mm -hmm. don't see very many people that have their bylaws still set at 30 days. Mm -hmm. They have it to 15, but I think you're probably ahead of the curve if you got it at seven, because depending on how you're going to flow this information to the portal, if you're going to say it's going to flow within 48 hours, you're going to want it to flow within 48 hours and want it authenticated, I would think. So that's another thing you need to look at is to, if it's going to flow to the portal, does it flow even if it hasn't been authenticated by the physician? Or does it require authentication? On our portal, it does not, uh, it will not cross till it is signed by the physician. Okay. So that's then that would be something that you would need to make note of. And so that if a, for if for some reason on the, a patient goes to the portal and they, they know it's gonna be seven days before it could possibly be there. And now I don't know how you're educating the patients on what to expect when they go to the portal, but if they go to the portal and it's been 10 days post their discharge and they can't get what they're looking for, they should know who to contact. And we're, we're going to uh, address that on our um, internet page for the system okay. and things like that. So I would like to take a moment uh, because this is about our medical staff. Uh, if any of you would like to speak with Ms. Rada or have some questions, just press uh, star six and that will unmute your line and you can ask her very specific questions. She is the uh, proud to know that Ms. Uh, Rada, she's got some good answers for us. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, my question is, so you said that if a provider is unable to fulfill uh, the request due to uncontrollable events mm -hmm. and the patient goes to the portal to try to get that information and we have 10 days to respond, how are we going to know that the patient's gone to the portal to request in the first place? Well, two ways. From what I understand, now, what, what do you have as a system there? Is it Epic, Cerner, what is it? We have Paragon, but we have Follow My Health. Uh, okay. And that is a program. Pete Furlow's on the, the webinar with us, and that's a program he uh, and I control. Um, we okay. have uh, set it up to where they're trying to put a message in there. If you don't have what you need in the portal, 
please contact ChartFast, go to ChartFast.com, and then we will upload what you need or contact, say, like me, and then we can put it to paper if we need to. Okay. We're, we're opening that communication that way. Okay, and then my question would be, if the patient's in the portal and they're, you know, in, in, if there's an H&P that's supposed to be there and it's not there, right. but they go to that, is there going to be some, some systems are actually going to ping. So the patient's there and it's not, the document they're looking for is not there. It's going to ping back to that individual who's going to monitor that portal to say, oh, this patient's looking for this. Uh, let me see what happened because it's been 10 days and our bylaws say seven. So why has this not flown? You know, why is it not fl flowed over to the portal? So that would be the question I ask. I've talked to Epic. I know Epic's going to do it that way. But um, so, Pete, uh, I, I think she said you were on the line. Do you want to comment to that? Or is there any way you're going to have a, a way to make us send a message back if the patient's? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything built within the Follow My Health patient portal that you know, will monitor a patient's activity in while they're in the portal, you know, kind of monitoring what they're looking for. But we can certainly reach back out to follow my health and see what other options might be available. Yeah, and, and as long as you, as Donna said, as long as you have some kind of message on the portal that if you're looking for something and, and it's not there, please contact Donna Crew. You know, if you're if you got the met if you've got a contact person for that patient, then you've met the obligation as well right. and at that point then we would work with that individual physician and and we do get people who are discharged and then come down right now and you know it's like nothing is even crossed over it's not even midnight uh that want a copy of the record so i mean we, we've got a very good tight team here to to work with that everybody will jump on board with what we need but yeah. um, Dr. Stan uh, Seifer, do you want to, you got a question? I do have a quick question. At the beginning, thank you very much, first off, for delivering this incredibly important information, first and foremost. But okay. I do have a question. Um, you mentioned bare minimums of information that needs to be required for the patient. Is there something that we could have that could I guess, illustrate that to make sure that our physicians are documenting appropriately or the inform that inf particular information is being carried over? Because that, 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 really, that really stuck out to me when you said that. Yeah, I'm going to move back over to show you this. This You may, your, your system may already be certified, so it may be using the core data elements, but they're very, very close to this. This, what I'm showing you on this slide, if you're looking at that, is the United States Core Data Elements for Interoperability, and this is version one. That's what is they're aiming for. So if you've got all of these things flowing to the portal, you should be golden. And if you don't have all of these, if you have at least what your system is currently certified under, which would be the core elements, and it might not include the things that are listed as new, so you see on that slide where it says clinical notes, new, provenance, new, that those were added. And I don't think they were actually made part of the um, a core common data elements that existed before they released this. They released this because, um, especially with provenance, because they want to be able to track since, since they're moving toward a, a a place where the patient could actually contact the payer and say, I want you to send information back to my physician. Or I could say, I've got my, all of my health records are going to be at Erlanger Health System. And I've won to, to uh, Vanderbilt uh, for a specialty visit. I could tell Vanderbilt, I want them to push that back to Erlang. And then I could have my, my, PHR that I'm going to say that I want controlled in one place. So you've got to be able to receive it. And then if you receive it, you've got to intake it and know who the author was and the date and how it's going to overlay. So it's a, it's a very um, focused information governance. So I would, I would think, and Donna, you can tell me if I'm right, but information governance um, should be already in play between health information and IT or your CIO. Oh, it uh, already. is. It okay. is, and, and like on the UC CDI um, list, Dr. Sanford, 
Paragon, our group uh, is only not meeting three of these little uh, things like we're not, it's not capturing drug class. There's something to do on the background of my previous address and, and something like that. It's just a couple data fields. And on those, I will claim the exception that I don't have the content manner, but it's not uh, critical items to ensure patient care. We've already, uh, Pete and I have already kind of walked through that and compared it to what we have in our system and then also what we can produce on a CDA. Does anyone Rodney ever Snead, can have you hear a question? Me? Yes, sir, Dr. Snead, what can we help you with today? Um, could you direct us? Uh, thank you sir, very much for the presentation. That is so helpful. Um, are there any sample policies and procedures or templates for small offices that we might be pointed to for these things? You know, I'll have to I'll have to do a little research on that. I'm thinking maybe that the AHA may have something uh, or the American Medical Society. I'm not sure. So, Donna, I'll do a little research and let you know that. But what I would go to first and foremost is the FAQs because the FAQs give you the examples for training purposes the, of what is what is likely to be considered information blocking and what is unlikely to be. And again, they use the word likely and unlikely because they're not gonna be affirmative um, because they don't know what they don't know yet either. So that's how they're um, referring to it. And Dr. Well, I, I'm not aware of any particular policy procedures and Donna, I don't think AHIMA has prepared any for a. No, they have, they have not at this point, but Dr. Snead, I've been producing some stuff for Dr. Frey and Dr. Bedikoff, and I can get you some copies of uh, the statements from AMA uh, and okay. uh, the FAQs like uh, uh, Ray is talking about, uh, and I'll just shoot that to you in email if you want, and if anybody else is on the call and would like that, just send me an uh, email to dcrew at rmccares.org, and I can send that. I've got a desk full of stuff right now. And Donna, the other um, source you may want to check on is if uh, the Medical Group Management Association, MGMA, they may have, um, I usually find them very helpful okay. for practices. All right. I Anybody? Have a cool. Go ahead. I do. Hey, this is Dr. Free again, and I'm sorry if I didn't say thank you for this wonderful information. Oh, it's, you're most um, welcome. Yes, yes, you guys are great. So you were saying, could you can you describe maybe just briefly what a disincentive through CMS would be um, if we as physicians don't have uh, information available for the patients to read? You were saying something about the dis disincentive, but it's not until 2022? 2022 and i'm thinking more in, in i mean from a patient perspective the disincentives might be in your reimbursement is what i'm thinking okay. i don't know that for a fact but i and then as this progresses uh you know if you have HEDIS request and those other kind of requests if we're certain feedback is supposed to go to to them um mm -hmm. then if that's not automatically flowing then there could be a disincentive there as well but I don't, I don't have all of this, the specifics on that. I am guessing that's what they're referring to. It has not been published yet. So they haven't shared okay. what Thank you. Donna, you're on mute. You're talking, but no one can hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure that the medical staff, uh, especially here in Calhoun County, are aware if we move down the days on the portal, uh, there are a lot of people that are getting their results already before uh, the physicians have had time to look at it. Uh, especially we, we have a lot of women running out, you know, and they're going to get in a mammo and then wanting to see the results the next day. Right now, we have the portal. To, it's delayed a few days, uh, but that that needs to be took in consideration uh, by the medical staff. And again, as long as you've got it documented, Donna, 
and the, mm -hmm. the medical staff has agreed to that for the rules and regs and it's documented accordingly and you're operating and no exceptions to that you're fine mm -hmm. so because there's nothing that says you have to have open notes it's written okay. and it goes nothing says that yet okay that was my mistake i really thought it was it started on monday myself so for open notes uh-huh now but open notes is not a current requirement mm -hmm. um you know, you just got to be consistent with the process that you currently got in your rules and regs. Now, a lot of people are pushing for open notes, mm -hmm. but open notes differs. I know I was um, I was actually in D.C. on a panel and I was sitting by a physician from Vanderbilt and I was sitting by somebody from um, Amia and Amy was said, you got to have open notes. And so then this physician that I was sitting by said, I have we have open notes. And I went, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, we have open notes. And I said, well, I'm a patient <laughs> and I've tried to get my notes. And I said, and, and I was looking seven days post my visit. And he said, oh, we don't release them to the portal for 12 days. And I said, oh, well, I guess it all depends on how you define open notes. <laughs> so, um, so it really does depend on how you define that and flow, have it flow, but it doesn't necessarily mean immediate. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that clarification because I've been leading the staff the wrong way at that point. So I'll do some more study and listen to some more of your webinars. And get oh, Donna, on that one. Donna, that that brings up a, a very sticky situation. Unfortunately, you know how we are as physicians. We err on mm -hmm. the side of being a bit um, intolerant. Mm -hmm. And gosh, if we could just, if this was a rule, we'd be better at getting our documentation done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a timely basis so this is just opening up pandora's box isn't it <laughs> well your bylaws say seven days right mm -hmm. donna right well you got well, seven days at least you can't go beyond that <laughs> but that is absolutely true mm -hmm. yeah and I we have a did question. go ahead um this is dr bailey this is a good talk um that you said during your presentation something about the conversation happens having to happen if someone makes a request and you have like an in, in, inaccessibility or infeasibility problem and you have 10 business days and that you said that someone has to ha have a have someone should be uh, documenting, documenting the that. conversation. So does this ha when you say conversation, are you saying that it has to be like, like auditory, or can it be like an electronic conversation through email? Or it can be like an that? electronic, but you got to make sure the okay. patient received it because that's the thing. So, in other words, if you can, you could, you could have a verbal conversation and then immediately follow up and say, as as we have discussed, and do an email to the patient so that they know. So you'd have a documentation trail. Or if you couldn't reach right. them by phone or didn't want that process, then I would have a way to know that either they received the email, I'd have some kind of notification coming back if they're not opening that email. So you know you got to get to them before 10 days. Because you've okay. got you to know. That, uh -huh. Okay. Got it. You got to have documentation that they received it, like a certified something like that, sort of like a <laughs> return receipt something. I, um, I would but, suggest uh, that the, simply because if there's no documentation and the patient files a complaint uh, with OCR and OCR yeah. says, oh, we've gotten complaints from, you know, multiple patients in Alabama regarding this clinician mm -hmm. or this facility. They're going to come back and say, oh, they're going to they're going to send it to the OIG and say, we think there might be that reason for review. Now, they're not going right. to do any of that until they issue technical issues. You're going to be well aware that some complaints are being made because they're going to send you technical right. letters. But if at the end, then, if you've gotten technical letter after technical letter and they in the OIG were to review it, that's where those contemporaneous uh, notes would be so important. So okay. you know, um, the other quest two more questions. Uh, one is you like you gave the example of the bombing in Nashville. Now, if you have an issue that happens like the unforeseen circumstances that knocks out like your ability to communicate yeah. with your patient. Then that would be that that's an that? unforeseen thing, and you you would just document that accordingly. The patients couldn't okay. access and the portal that, during that time because it was well, the well, system was down because of network. 
Right, I understand that part, but you also, like, you could possibly not be able to access, like, the contact information to, to, to reach out to your patients right. to let them know. Do you know what right. I'm saying? Right, so would that it be, might be like that the, be thought? right, he might have a, a cyber attack. He might have, he, somebody might have, you know, opened up yeah. a, a phishing thing and, uh, you know, scam or, and so Or a ransomware or something down. like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So you, the documentation, that's why, you know, um, project managers are, are very important to this. So I would suggest, you know, Donna and, and you know, in the crew there that's that's doing this, I would have somebody that's, that's their job. They're, proj- they're managing the documentation capture and they manage it all the way through. So if there's ever a question, they can pull that. And, and I don't mean sticky notes and whatever. They got to be very diligent in their documentation. Okay. Let me one last question. What does API stand for? Um, applied um, oh, APIs. It's basically where it's um, applied technology where you, you can send the information over to their phone or like Google Health. So they have an API. For example, I have lupus. So so I have a program already, that, but it's not coming automatically from my patient portals. I'm entering information so that I can manage and look at, you know, where my highs and lows are. But the APIs is basically that it's designed so that the patient can go to the portal and then download into a specific device okay. that's been pre-certified. Uh, so it basically stands for something to say you have to provide it to whatever type of electronic thing that they have. Is that yeah, what you're, you're saying? Right. Like Google Health, you know, Google Health's already okay. started. Um, okay. and people already said, you know, what if they come and say they want it downloaded to Google Health? Well, you know, it's got to be certified with your EHR vendor because you don't want to connect something that could inter- interject a virus or something. So if there's got to be a certification to that API that the vendor has to, to work on. So that's not going to come into play until uh, that October 6, 2022 date. But you need to be thinking in terms of, of what in, um, what you may want to do. And that's another question that people about often ask me, which APIs do we need to have? Well, that's up to you and right. the patient. Um, you know, from a standpoint of what I would look at is what's your what's your biggest cause of readmissions or what's your biggest chronic condition, you know, in your population. Um, that's the ones I'd want to control to help them improve their health care and help the patient manage their own health better to keep them out of the hospital. All right. Thank you. I have one more question, please. Okay. So, so patients are savvy and they're smart and they're, some of them are sinister and some of them have a manner of um, trying to, to sue doctors for whatever reason. Now, if it's a malpractice for cause, that's one thing. If this is um, a whistleblower type event and patients become savvy, and they report a physician or physician or a hospital stating that they can't get their records. They know that they're supposed to get their records at a, in a certain amount of time. OIG goes out to evaluate and finds out that the whistleblower is blowing smoke and that it's not true. What, what, are, the, what are the repercussions for that for the patient as well as the physician? Well, to my knowledge, there currently is no repercussion to a whistleblower. Wow. Um, now that's to my knowledge. Not, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that could happen to a whistleblower. Anybody can say there's a problem, um, and then it has to be evaluated. That's why the onus is upon on, on us in, in healthcare to maintain our documentation accordingly. Um, again, you know, if the if someone notified ONC or CMS that you know they felt like they were they were incurring. Uh, information blocking are like these cases where um, the, the facilities were notified, those 18 cases that I refer to on patient access. None of those just got notified out of the blue. Every one of them had had previous notification with technical advice, technical advice, technical advice. They didn't take the technical advice. So that's when the OIG actually came in and said, okay, this oh, is why I'm going to... Yeah, the civil money penalty. Now, anybody that gets a civil money penalty 
has the opportunity to go to the DOJ, the um, uh, administrative law judge, the ALJ, and actually appeal it. And, and you know, if you're if you're doing that, you're taking taking all the high powered attorneys from your organization with you. And that's where they would be taking all that documentation that's been collected contemporaneously as to, you know, why decisions were made and why this was not an issue. So that's why I said the doc, the person that's doing the documentation and maintaining the files is so important um, on that review. You want to appoint one person that may have a team of people, but there's a go to on that. All right, I know we're about uh, five minutes after. If you've got time for one more question. One more? One more question. Information flowing between facilities. How are mm -hmm. you envisioning that and it, that being blocked? Uh, I've had some complaints before. Oh, Dr. So-and-so won't send me notes um, because you know, my patient, I guess, moved to another physician's office. Uh, does well, that come into play into this? Yes. For interoperability, it's, let's, let's look at it like this. HIPAA is over here. So we've all worked under HIPAA for years and years. And HIPAA was very structured that you, you're, it's a, it was a net of protection that you won't share this information unless you're authorized to or directed to. And a lot of people, the reason we're over here now with interoperability is a lot of people didn't take into the fact that they were supposed to share for continuity of care or for treatment and payment and operations. So now they've got this rule, the interoperability rule that says, if you can share it, you must share it. Mm -hmm. So when you get into this kind of stuff that I've got on the screen now, that USCDI that's been identified as core elements for continuity of care, that must be shared. And what the intent is, is that when a patient is leaving your facility and they're going from acute care to a skilled care, that this these elements would go over as elements into the skilled care facilities record. If they're coming from the skilled care back to acute care, it goes with that. It's more patient centric than it is um, facility centric. So that's the way I would look at this. They're looking at it's it's the patient information rather than an episode within a facility and an episode here. It's it should be these things are going to influence how you would deliver care. Can I ask one more question? I know it's too late, but I'm really I really want to ask one quick question. Okay. All right. HIPAA has been used to completely stymie the effects of physicians getting feedback and follow up on patients uh, go, that we transfer to different in, in, institutions. Has there, as, 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 is there anything in this new thing to help with that because it, because of, of people um, misinterpreting HIPAA to say that we can't get any information back to like say, if I transfer a patient that I took care of, to another institution and I want to find out what happened to them for my, in order to improve my practice. Um, it, 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 this should be that if it was your patient and you transferred them there and they're going to come back to you because you're the, the, uh, no, uh, well, primary no, physician. Not necessarily that they're coming, well, well, primary physicians, they can, they're going to get their information, right. but I'm a PR doc. So I don't necessarily, I'm not going to be getting them again, but if I have some provisional diagnoses and I need to know, and I want to know if, if I was correct, this, you know, this, or, or if, if the certain management things that I, management decisions that I made, how they impacted the patient so I can, you know, improve my practice. Right. Um, it actually, never, you know, this, it won't come under the interoperability rule. What it will come under though, is the new notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, which is basically the new HIPAA. <laughs> they they released um, the day before the inauguration. They released the in the Federal Register a, a new HIPAA regulation, a, a totally revised, updated. Um, now, I, I can tell you, I read it the first time, and I went, well, "What were they drinking?" I mean, it was it was not well written. It was like they pulled from here and pulled from there. But in that rule, which 
your facility is probably going to be making or your, the group should be making a response by May 6th. Uh, May 6th, you've gotten until then until to make your comments to that rule. That rule allows for medical judgment. So in other words, if you've if you're telling them you need it because you want to see if you know your quality of care was good, if you need to make improvements, that's a medical judgment. It allows for the sharing. Um, unfortunately, HIPAA when it started was very much like a it was police. You know, it was the you you were like it was the Nazi, <laughs> almost the uh, HIPAA Nazis. What I was even called that early in my early career because <laughs> you know it was so guarded, um, and and people didn't understand it. And unfortunately, because just what you just said, um, people have still said, "No, I can't share that with you unless I do this." We're still finding even for continuity of care purposes, some organizations saying no. I can't share that unless you get the patient to sign an authorization. The patient can't sign an authorization. They're unconscious in ICU and they're treating the patient. You're supposed to send it, but there are people that still misunderstand uh, that rule to this day. So there's two schools of thought. You know, HIPAA might be just totally throwing, throw the baby out with the bathwater or you update it and make it work more collectively with interoperability. And that's what my response for my organization that I work for, where we, we are responding and we're responding that it should harmonize with this rule. This rule should be the, um, take precedence over anything else. And so we, we say, if well, you're gonna have a HIPAA rule, it should, it should harmonize with this. And right now it does not. Okay, well, if you, if, if you get, if you uh, have any like updates that, that address that problem, and you get it to Dot, you know, if you could get it to Donna and get it to get it to us, because that would make a my, that would make at least ER dots a lot, you know, better. Okay. Because half that's the one thing that we can't do is get follow up if we don't admit the patient to our own place. And a lot of the you know, um it would it would make you know, it would it would improve things, that's all I gotta say. So if you could, if you get that, if you get yeah. anything, I'm, I'm all here. And, and Donna, I will tell Yeah, and Donna, you right. may want to reach out to um, Erlanger. I hadn't been there in nine years, but, you know, but when I was okay. there, because we were a level one trauma center, we were getting patients airlifted from, you know, North Carolina, sometimes from North Alabama, mm -hmm. Georgia. And and we we often got calls for that information. We always shared it. Mm -hmm. So that, I don't know if they have a policy or something that they could refer to, or if maybe I just did it because I wanted to do it because I felt it was the right thing to do. But mm -hmm. um, you might want to check with the director there. I'm not sure who, what they might have. Oh, well. and, okay. Well, all righty. I appreciate the time this afternoon. And Donna, if you receive any other questions, uh, just reach out to me. Be happy to, you know, follow up with another little quick call or something, or I'll just work one-on-one -on -one with you. Thank you so much. You are such a blessing. And thank, thank you, you for everything you do. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye-bye.